Am I, do I have permission to share my screen? Yes, it looks like I do. Um, um, not right now, please. Um, we're going to have another speaker before you. Oh, sorry. Okay. I thought you just asked me to speak. Fine. No, sorry. Yeah. Uh, we're a bit, bit behind schedule, so um, I do apologise. Don't worry. We've just had our break and we returned from our break. And now we're going to hear from Dr. Zafar Iqbal, who um, is a senior policy officer from Wilkinboro Council. But today he's going to be sharing his personal experience of loss during COVID-19. So when you're ready, please. Dr. Zafar, can't right, see can you. you. Like, can you hear me now? Yep, can hear you now, yeah. Hi, um, good morning to everybody, and as a Muslim, assalamu alaikum to all of you. May Allah's peace be upon you. Um, I would also like to share my personal experience uh, of going through the COVID, and uh, what I'll do is I'll give you a bit of background to my family, and then the timeline of what actually happened in terms of my personal experience, and how it actually impacted me personally, as an individual uh, from a personal point of view and spiritual point of view and how it's actually um, changed some of my views on different things and how it's actually continue to have an impact on me at a personal level. Um, to be honest with you, up to about December, um, I did not actually have much of an impact from COVID personally. And, and just like everybody else, you know, you are going through normal life and uh, working from home sometimes and different things. And around about um, 20th of, uh, 10th of December, uh, I live with my wife and three children and my aunt. And uh, she picked up the uh, infection from school and it stayed like that until uh, and I thought I'd actually missed it by about, but by about 20th of December, uh, I started getting, um, you know, uh, the infection and it deteriorated very rapidly. And that included my aunt as well as myself, uh, who was about 69, 70 at that time. My children had it, but they actually survived it fairly good. But my wife actually had a quite strong uh, infection herself, uh, and she had to actually pull through the whole of what actually happened to myself and my aunt from there on. Uh, on 23rd of December, uh, we had to ring the ambulance because my aunt wasn't feeling well. And they came in and uh, uh, checking our oxygen levels, they decided the best thing to do was to actually take her to hospital. This was in the evening uh, on December 23rd. And around about seven o'clock, I, I believe, and about 11 o'clock, we had a call from uh, St. Peter's that she had passed away within four hours of being in the hospital. Uh, at that time, my own health was pretty seriously bad. I could hardly actually go to the toilet myself uh, because my legs were trembling uh, with the weakness and my breathing was getting uh, significantly worse at that time. So by morning, around about three or four o'clock, I told my wife that my breathing is getting really bad and I can't breathe properly. And we rang the ambulance again. And I was, they came and they took me immediately to hospital. And I was admitted to hospital on my own again. And this thing about isolation is quite, quite serious really in, in all aspects, uh, what I experienced what I experienced in there. Um, I stayed in hospital for two weeks. Um, uh, thankfully, I wasn't ventilated, but it was quite serious uh, infection I had. And I was on this PEF machine um, for about eight days. It was touch and go, whether I'll be ventilated or whether I'll actually pull through it or not. Uh, and um, I'd just like to explain one of the experiences I had in there, I think, especially the nurses, uh, their service in there was out of this world, to be honest with you. Um, we all have to die sooner or later anyway. And uh, be, me being a Muslim, you know, we firmly believe that, you know, uh, every soul shall actually taste uh, death sooner or later. But on that particular day, 
I was in pretty bad state and uh, this nurse comes in the morning around about five or six o'clock and she says, I'm the nurse who will be looking after you today. My name is Anna. And the only thing that get, uh, that I had in, had in my mind with my eyes closed was this is my savior angel coming to save me uh, on that particular day. And I was in a pretty poor state to be honest with you. And this nurse, Anna, she got my head in our uh, in our arm and caressed my head and said do not worry about it you will pull through this and that was almost like my mother caressing my hair as a child and i can't just forget how good that was for me in terms of pulling out of this uh, illness at that time and i did pull through that to be honest with you um, and i can never forget that uh, in terms of what she did for me uh, on there. Um, as, as I started recovering, it, it took about two weeks and by 7th of January, I was discharged from the hospital. But the other thing that actually struck me very strongly was the prayer of power. And I learned, some of the people were messaging me while I was in the hospital, but I learned later so many people I had actually known right through my life and maybe I've not heard from them for years and years. Uh, and they were they were praying for me constantly and regularly. And that really, I, I think I think prayer is a very, very important component of actually helping people pull through uh, their personal experiences uh, in adversity, health adversity and things like that. And it wasn't just my Muslim friends, you know, I had I have friends from all faiths um, and, and one particular uh, person, uh, and his family, they not only prayed for me, they even fasted for me, and they're Christians. And that was very moving for me, and uh, it, it, it really did touch my heart in, in, in what people do for each other. Um, in all this, um, you know, my, my aunt, uh, bless her, I lived most of her life caring for her and living with her. Um, she died on 23rd. I, you know, I mean, I was in hospital and as a Muslim, we actually have to bury our uh, dead as soon as possible. And uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it'll be a regret for the rest of my life that I couldn't actually go to a, uh, be part of our funeral uh, service. And um, I had to ask my, one of my nephews uh, to actually help me through, uh, you know, organizing it and everything. And she was buried while I was actually in hospital at that time. Um, and in terms of my wife, I think she had quite serious illness herself, but to actually go through with one death and her husband on almost on a deathbed in, uh, uh, in hospital and three children to look after who had also gone through this process, I think it must have been a really horrendous experience for her uh, from that point of view. Um, I think also how the community you live in also helps you and supports you. I cannot forget uh, uh, and be thankful to Coaster herself and her husband, uh, Imam Ashmi, how supportive they had been right through while I was in hospital and even after that, to be honest with you, in, in helping my wife, with, even with shopping and even bringing food uh, cooked uh, at their home. Uh, and I think I think the, this is what makes communities and this is what actually helps people to be people, you know, to be human beings. Uh, from that point of view. Um, since then, I think um, I also like to uh, thank not just the hospital, but from my employer's perspective, I think Walking Borough Council has been absolutely tremendous in supporting me. Um, they have actually helped me to actually pull through up to now. I unfortunately ended up with a quite severe long COVID and uh, keep having these bouts of different issues with my health every three or four weeks uh, on a regular basis, unfortunately. And um, uh, long COVID is a little understood disease from that point of view, and uh, not much is known about it. And every test you do, uh, nothing comes uh, of it. And it's just, you know, um, signboard is as posted as a long COVID from that point of view, you know. Um, but hopefully, uh, you know, I, I, I believe there's a lot of people who are actually suffering from it, over a million people. And the most common 
thing you hear from these people is that your shell looks the same, but inside is totally different. And it's very difficult to actually get back the inside of you again uh, to the forefront in, in where you were uh, pre-COVID. Um, I think adversity for human society is nothing new. And it is, it is pandemics and things like these, uh, which have, uh, occur naturally, which help people and societies uh, to bring out their humane nature and uh, how to actually tackle these things actually tells you uh, the quality of society in which you are living. And I think we are made, we have made some great progress in terms of where we were, where we are, and where we are likely to go in the future. Um, I'd, I, I think in, in my personal experience, people, and I've actually been doing some work with in terms of vaccination and make, uh, making people understand and its adverse effect, particularly on low income families, a poorer section of our community, uh, where, it's, 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 where it's actually has a bigger impact than anywhere else. Um, I, think, I think we will pull through this uh, in, in time. Um, and it actually teaches us how to be even better human beings in that sense, really. Um, I don't know what else I can actually say about this, but it's, it's been a journey. It's been a tough journey for me personally, uh, but I think the, the help and, and, and connection with friends and family and other members of the community actually helps you to uh, live through the times of difficulty. Um, I don't think I've got anything else to say. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Zafar, especially for sharing your very personal experiences there. Um, it's something that has touched uh, all of us and we are all impacted by it. Um, we missed out on the Q&A session. So now I'd like to um, take any questions for our previous speakers either Dr. Sohail Bhatti or um, Jamie Green, or, or even our previous uh, speakers from the morning session from, uh, or um, I think Lawrence has gone now, he had to do, uh, he has to lead a funeral prayer. And of course, Dr. Zafir is here. So over to Emil and David, if you have any questions. Um, rather than questions, I have a couple of comments uh, for uh, Jamie here. Sabah says, uh, your story is truly humbling and resonates in Surrey and across the country. Uh, it has been blessings emerging from uh, COVID and the way disparities in communities were highlighted and the way communities came together and ensuring public bodies and other partners, communities alike come together to manage, mitigate some of these impacts. Uh, we cannot uh, at Surrey Council underestimate the role of faiths and faith leaders in that they have been pivotal to an effective response and we have since established conduits to ensure we build on some of this great work, making the best of our collective strengths. I totally agree with that, uh, representing Slough Faith Partnership, we were part of one slough and sitting at weekly meetings and uh, passing messages all the time and whenever there is something relevant to a particular faith community mm -hmm. arranging uh, meetings and etc so and uh, thank you Sabah I think she's left now Anderson says thank you Jamie good to hear community cohesion can still work despite times when it seems that we build silos at the eco chambers uh, where red tape and dogma bind things up so tightly that the project dies. Again, totally agree with this personal experience I had. Uh, there was a person in my daily job, I work with uh, people with mental health conditions and one person burst into tears saying, What's the point of art? We are doing art therapy. Uh, if my children is, uh, are hungry, I said, aren't you on the support list? Uh, somehow she slipped the net. And immediately I phoned the 
support network. Uh, Jamie's group has got immense volunteers, uh, 24 hour manning the phone lines. And within half an hour, this family has been put on the food distribution list and they got their first parcel within three hours. So mm. uh, I cannot praise enough what we have done. I say we because I'm part of that as well. Uh, another message comes from Sheikh uh, Fazl Abbas. Um, ML, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, ML. Um, there was a direct message sent to me by Stephen Inns. Is it okay if I address that? It's a yes, question. Yes, that's fine. It's a question to Sohail Bhatti about his presentation. Um, Thank you for your insight. You mentioned the succession of pandemics that regularly occur in history and more recently. Are further pandemics inevitable? Should we, should we be philosophical and accept them? Or what one thing could be done to prevent them affecting the world so much? So I believe that's to Dr. Sohail Bhatti. I don't know if he's still here. Yeah, I am. Uh, th thank you. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, uh... Pessimistic and optimistic answer, really. Uh, yes, uh, pandemics are inevitable. Whenever we have aggregation of large numbers of people, there is the possibility of spread. And now that we're in a globally connected community, uh, the infection can spread beyond its um, traditional boundaries. Hence, there was a lot of concern about Ebola, for example, not staying in West Africa. And some of these diseases are, no, are new, so we actually don't know what the long-term consequences are. I remember reading about the 1918 flu pandemic, and people may have been aware of the the film Rain Man, where uh, people 20 years later started being subject to paralysis because bits of their brain that were responsible for movement had been damaged during the flu pandemic. And then 60 years later, people were still measuring the impact of the 1918 pandemic. In 1978, they found that babies that were being conceived and uh, in pregnancy during the pandemic had higher levels of coronary heart disease. And, uh, you know, Zuffer said uh, very clearly that we, uh, we can suffer long-term effects and we really don't know what those long-term effects are, how long they will last. Someone, doctor said to me the other day, he said, kidney function falls throughout your life. It's a finite resource. Most of us die before we run out of kidney function. But if, for example, getting COVID damaged your kidneys, then we may have an epidemic of um, kidney problems in, in people in their 60s, or potentially we know it damages the brain. So uh, what can we do? I think ultimately we need a rapid and early warning system. And I think the, the globe is um, blessed in having a high scientific endeavor. The enemy of sharing knowledge is secrecy. And that's what we must always fight against, this desire by people to hope for the best, but we should always plan for the worst. That's the only safe way to go about it. If we hope for the best and plan for the best, then we will be shocked and, and we will suffer the consequences of it. And the worst case scenario is not yet happened. We, we've had an airborne disease, but an airborne disease that strikes people by age. Um, the older you are, the worst your outcomes are. Imagine a disease where it was airborne and it affected the young more, which is what the flu pandemic did in 1918. That would be truly, truly tragic and, and, and devastating for all of us because we, we, our faith, our, our hopes are imbued in our young people who, who are largely innocent of any problems. Um, so I think having a good surveillance system, having early response, and possibly having politicians who are not afraid of making unpopular decisions. I'd have to say that I was able to galvanize, having had a cabinet meeting in Gibraltar, galvanize the whole political class a lot earlier. And I had the chief minister saying to me, but where are the bodies? You know, I expect, I saw them in Madrid, I saw them in London, I saw them in North, where are our bodies? And what we had done, in fact, we stop the bodies accumulating because we'd acted before the bodies accumulated. And unfortunately, our economic and our political system um, only rewards people who have uh, rescued us from disaster when disaster is imminent. It does not protect and reward people from disaster that hasn't taken place. And, you know, I referred to 2008 as the damp squib 
pandemic? Well, actually, we took actions, and a lot of those actions did mean that there was not the disaster that we thought might happen. That's a celebration. That should be a point of celebration, not a point of cursing our system by saying, oh, you overreacted. Um, so we have, to, we have to put in systems globally, um, and we have to put in um, some additional surveillance system, and we have to elect politicians capable of taking courageous decisions. And that's a, that's a common thing for all our communities, really. We really need to judge our politicians when they stand for election, how courageous are they going to be if they have to make unpopular decisions? Because we may depend on their courageousness if there's another pandemic. Thank you. Thank you for a very honest answer. Thank you. Um, Emil, back over to you. Yes, there was another comment for Jamie. Um, I will quickly go through really impressive presentation. Uh, it, it, this is actually a blessing again. It allows us the opportunity to, to reflect and gain learnings, as Dr. Sohail said, and uh, bringing us together. I consider this a wake-up call, not to take things for granted, be alert, and don't take the blessings of life for granted. And uh, when we return to normality, we all talk about this, won't we? Um, will men be ungrateful and return to living life like what was before? I hope it will not be the same normality as before, but a renewed and refreshed normality, less burdensome with real compassion for neighbor and more space for faith and charity. God bless. Uh, thank you, Sheikh Fazel. That's marvelous. And Zarina says thank you for the stories and challenges. And Tim Timothy says valuable insights, contributions from all speakers covering a wide spectrum of experiences and practical input. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I've just got a direct message from Pete Baldwin, who asked if you can relate his mild experience. If that was for me, Pete, yes, you can. And then we'll uh, hear from uh, Dr. Joanna Colico, who's going to tell us about avoiding science and hopefully intrigue us enough to join again at two o'clock to hear, from, uh, hear uh, in more detail from her. So Pete, if you want to share your experience. Okay. In the first two lockdowns, I tried to behave myself fairly well. Um, when I left my flat um, and used public transport or used the shops, I wore a mask. And I, I left my flat about once a week and stayed behind, you know, stayed inside otherwise uh, most of the time uh, to go to Sainsbury's on my bicycle to buy groceries. Every time I got back to my flat, it's never happened before in my life, every time I got back to my flat, I was coughing and spluttering a bit. And I thought, where have I got this from? The air? Chemtrails, perhaps? COVID-19 in the chemtrails from the airlines? I don't know. Anyway, I thought, well, I'd better do something about this. So I dosed myself up with a substantial dose of vitamin C. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, four to six grams of powder. A heap teaspoonful, that's about uh, three to... Uh, what how did I say? Four to six. Six to... Four to six thousand milligrams, approximately. And that knocked it on the head after about 12 hours, until about a week later when I went out again and got the same uh, symptoms. Now, I saw informal social reports from Wuhan doctors, not through the Chinese government, but socially on the social media on Facebook, informally, saying the only thing that works against COVID, in their experience, is 50 grams of vitamin C intravenously every day. And I can tell you that I, after 31 years of toxic neuroleptic tranquilizers, in 2007, uh, was given um, some help with a unqualified layman who had done lots of internet research, had treated and helped about 200 people before me. And he, I went up to see him in North Wales and he put me on Lidl's mandarin flavoured German epivescent tablets, starting with one milligram and then going up and spacing it out during the day and then stopping when I needed to go to the loo because when you when the body's absorbed enough vitamin c for its needs it excretes what it doesn't need and you can tell when you go to the loo so um I did that and I got up to 69 grams in one day before I needed to go to the loo 
And then the next day it went down to 60, and now it's a maintenance dose, about 6 grams. Uh, someone advised me, if you don't need vitamins, don't take them. So from 2017, when Dr. Brian passed away after a stroke, I stopped taking vitamins. And then when the, when the lockdown happened, I thought, well, let's put, put myself back on them just to be on the safe side. Uh, 2007, there was a New Zealand tele, uh, television news item that is on YouTube where a doctor, um, a farmer had contracted um, avian flu, I think it was, and his lungs were all, almost full of liquid to, due to pneumonia. He was on a ventilator, he was in a coma, and his family had heard about megavitamin therapy, which has been suppressed by the pharmaceutical industry for 70 years. And uh, he, met, he started to make a recovery. The doctors didn't like it, so they took him off and he started to deteriorate again. So the family threatened him with lawyers if they didn't put him back on intravenous vitamin C. He made a full recovery. Now, this kind of information seems to be suppressed in the fake news of the Western so-called mainstream news services. Why? It's, a, it's genocide on a massive scale. I mean, you know, the, the evidence is not really very empirical. You, you know, you're not going to find it very often in the mainstream medical industry, which arguably was taken over by the John D. Rockefeller Foundation about 1912 to create a monopoly for the pharmaceutical industry and make a killing after, after the antitrust business um, movement broke up his standard oil monopoly in about 1905. I, you know, I, I haven't done the research that in that much detail, so I don't really know my facts very well. But this seems to be the, the broad thrust of what's been happening. It's astonishing in its falsity. And you can't find very many people can actually hear what I'm saying. It, it's too much. I mean, you know, 2007, I was shocked for several years by what I was discovering. Utterly unbelievable. But the... the the Himalayan mountain range of anecdotal and circumstantial evidence seems very compelling and very difficult to dismiss. And it seems to be growing. So uh, that's sorry, about it, really. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I, um, I could go on for hours, but you know me or my friends know me anyway. <laughs> thank you. I'm sure you'll be welcome to join us for the afternoon session where we talk about um, avoiding science in a bit more detail and where we can bring that in. Um, so now I'd like to invite um, Dr. Joanna Colico, um, who's a supernumerary fellow, Harris Man Manchester College, Oxford. And she's going to be talking about avoiding science, just giving us an introduction. And then we'll hear from her in more detail at two o'clock. Hey, thank you, Claudia. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't here for all of the talks this morning. It sounds like they were um, really inspiring. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the darker side of religiosity. So uh, is it OK if I share my screen? Yes. Um, hmm. oh, looking all right. Um, bear with me. Apologies. Um, okay, uh, I'll just have one more go at sharing, and if it doesn't work, then um, I will. Uh, no. Okay, I'll try and sort that out for this afternoon. Don't know what went wrong there, um, and I will just uh, try and talk to the simple slide that I. Uh, had prepared, which um, is just why just drawing on my discipline of psychology of religion. Joanna, sorry to interrupt. You are actually doing a screen share, and we can see introducing Zoom apps. So you, you may you might want to end Stop screen. screen share. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's better. Yeah. So apologies for that. So. Um, what you would have seen if I'd got the slide on was a, a slide with a few images. Um, first of all, um, somebody being vaccinated, a picture of um, Martin Clutes, who plays Doc Martin in the television series, uh, a picture of evangelical Christians praying with Donald Trump, a picture of Michael Gove and a picture of the COVID vaccine. 
Um, I'm going to pick up some of those themes in what uh, I want to uh, come on and say. So, as I said, I'm talking from a psychology of religion perspective, um, and psychologists of religion study uh, religion across the board, um, looking at the commonalities between faith traditions, looking at a number of perspectives uh, and a number of phenomena that are common to faith traditions. Uh, and one of the areas that we studied at some length is the relationship between faith and health and well-being. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that uh, indicates that um, for some of the reasons that you've touched on already, that there is a very strong relationship between having a faith and measures of health and well-being for all sorts of, of different reasons. But what, as I've mentioned, what I want to talk about um, today is uh, the darker side of that, because um, there are uh, aspects of faith that are not well associated with well-being or indeed with moral behaviour. And um, I'm going to talk about the avoidance of science, which is what I've been asked to do. So there are a number of complex factors that uh, are at work, I think, in the avoidance of science uh, in the population in general and in faith communities in particular. And there has been an indication through the pandemic that faith communities have been both scapegoated as um, uh, sources of transmission by holding super spreader events and not uh, complying with the regulations uh, that are in place, this is across the world, for um, managing COVID uh, and also with spreading misinformation. Um, and some of that is clearly scapegoating that has uh, no basis in reality, but some of it does seem to have um, at least something that's worth looking into more. So um, this morning, I just want to talk about the, the kind of setting conditions which are there at the moment in our culture. And there are so many of them. And I call the talk a perfect storm um, because they come together uh, and uh, have called up both uh, wonderful heroic behavior, um, but also behavior that is slightly more concerning. And they interrelate with each other. So on, on my slide, I have five main headings and they are first of all the conditions so the broad setting conditions um, and then the immediate context that we're in secondly the basic human responses to stress and perceived threat thirdly where we get our information from the available source of information fourthly epistemology that is the way that we understand knowledge to be gained and the rules of engagement that we use when we uh, uh, try and uh, expand our knowledge base. And fifthly, the forms that faith can take. So um, just in this short session this morning, I'm just going to begin to unpack, first of all, the conditions and if time get onto the human responses. So, we are inhabiting broadly, certainly in the West, a culture war between modernity and postmodernity. And one of the faces of modernity is science. And one of the points where culture, where that culture clash becomes evident uh, is in the delivery of science-based medicine. And uh, I enjoy that TV series, Doc Martin, um, for all sorts of reasons, but one of the things that I think is interesting about it is the way this is played out in that series, in which you have always, every episode, two alternative views about health and the human body, and they usually come into conflict with each other. So the plot is always the same. Doc Martin is objective, he's scientific, and there are others who are, that he is at a, a, a degree of conflict with, who approach life more intuitively. They often have a spiritual dimension to their life. And his view is that they are both stupid and superstitious. He's not, um, doesn't, isn't backward about expressing those views. Their view is that he is robotic and cold and detached. And what happens at the end of every episode is that he is proved right and vindicated to some degree by saving these other people from some disastrous real world disease or imminent death. 
And I think that kind of repeated plot line captures our unease with and distaste for a lot of the trappings of modernity, along with our dependence on its insights and the systems that it's generated. So we're in, um, in a sense, often that a place of kind of conflict, which is played out in an exaggerated form in that drama. And one of the kind of indicators of that kind of turf war about what it means to live well is that today, if you have a problem with living, you're more likely to consult a healthcare professional more broadly than a religious or a spiritual professional. And that's a change that's come with modernity. And the immediate context, and that's the broad context, the immediate context that we face is this threat from a highly transmissible disease with as yet no cure and a remaining uncertainty as to its future course. And that puts us into all sorts of dilemmas and dilemmas are defined or have been defined helpfully, I think, as a, a, a situation when you face a problem in which all solutions appear to be unfavorable in some respect. So you think of the trade-off of keeping kids out of school uh, and sending them to school, uh, how difficult a dilemma that is as to when you start to return kids into the school environment in the context of a pandemic. And where potential solutions conflict with each other, and this makes it difficult to act and can indeed paralyze us. There is, um, as part of that immediate context, a dimension of pollution. And work by anthropologists such as Mary Douglas have demonstrated that the degree of threat we feel in a situation is ratcheted up when um, pollution becomes part of the discourse and the perception. And in COVID, the obvious source of pollution are bodily fluids from other people transmitted um, in, in kind of micro droplets from their nose and their mouth. But there's been another interesting um, discourse on pollution that has emerged as the pandemic has gone on. And that is the view that vaccines are themselves threatening pollutants to our bodies. And vaccines um, uh, are introduced into our bodies uh, through penetration of our skin, which is, um, anthropologically speaking, has particular issues uh, that make uh, the threat even more um, compelling. So those are the setting conditions. And I'll just say a short amount about the, my next point before I stop, which is about how we typically respond when we are faced with those conditions. And uh, you know, in psychological terms, I'm talking about um, how we manifest anxiety. And there are three broad ways we do it. One is to face what we're dealing with um, by a kind of rational uh, problem solving approach or by defensive aggression, by hitting out at it. And think of all the, the kind of images of doing battle with COVID that we've um, heard in the past couple of years. Secondly, we may want to hide and avoid the threat. Um, and that is often worked out through uh, behavior that's around purity, around separation, hand washing, shielding, those kind of processes. And thirdly, we may want to pretend to ourselves that it doesn't exist because it's just so threatening and we escape into a kind of fantasy land. And you can see all of those processes at work in the way um, faith communities along with every other community has responded, um, but they have a particular flavor in the context of faith. And when I was first studying um, Jesus of Nazareth as a historical figure, and I had to look at the context in which he lived, which was a highly threatening context of an occupied people um, uh, who were on a constant state of alert. Uh, it was very interesting to explore the religious groups that were current at his time within Judaism, some of which were um, obsessed with purity, some of which uh, seemed to escape more into a world of fantasy and apocalyptic, and some who wanted to uh, face the threat around them head on uh, in a military and radical kind of way. Um, 
And this, just the, the retreat into escapism and fantasy is one of the things I think that has fed some of the distinctive aspects of faith communities avoiding science. And I think it's powerful because it interacts with our unease and distaste for modernity that I mentioned at the beginning. So we uh, would like to retreat from the threat that faces us and part of us would like to retreat from modernity as well. Not so much by advancing into a postmodern position, but by a nostalgic move to recapture pre-modernity. And of course, it's pre-modernity that is the origin of the majority of the world faith traditions. Our sacred texts, our practices, our artifacts, our metaphysics, our world views have their origins in a pre-modern context. And one of the strands of anti-science is a kind of idealization of the historical past that I would also say uh, the infantile past, the childlike past that we all long for if we've had a good childhood. Um, and it shows itself in phrases, one of which really struck me that, that came out of India um, at the height of the Delta variant um, pandemic there uh, in April this year, um, when there was a super spreader event um, in Uttarakhand state, where one um, person who was interviewed uh, about the risks of entering the Ganges said, but Mother Ganges will save us all. So there's a historic uh, entrenched ritual, there's the language of um, childhood and parental care, um, which is held alongside an awareness of modern science and causes um, conflict and the way that's resolved uh, can be to avoid science altogether. And that's what I'll talk about in more detail this afternoon. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Joanna. We're really looking, really looking forward to hearing you speak in more detail. Uh, that brings us to a close for the morning session. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone, especially our speakers. Thank you for giving up your time. And I do apologize. We had to change the program a little. These things happen when we are meeting virtually and we have technical problems and all kinds of things. So I do apologize. Um, and I look forward to hearing and seeing you virtually again in the afternoon. Um, if you have questions for um, Joanna, uh, you can either share them in the chat, you can email them to me, or you can just wait for the Zoom session to start at two o'clock and you can uh, put them in the chat at that time. So I'm gonna end recording now.